uh, I like to promote the, the, the good jiu-jitsu spirit, you know? And I think that's, you know, most, most people promote that and under, understand that, but sometimes people can take, uh, their ego a little too far and this and that. And I think, you know, Marcelo Garcia recently put out a speech that it seems like everybody's talking about. Yeah. It was very, I think, positive, positive message and, and good, maybe just like a bit of a wake up call, you know, so I'd like to leave this kind of same, um, feeling when I'm leaving a message on the mat or, or just in general, as I pass through life, you know? And, um, so I like to promote that, that positive side of jujitsu. Other than that, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm living the jujitsu lifestyle. I'm loving it. And, uh, I'm loving to see people enjoying the jujitsu that, that my family has, uh, started a couple of generations back in early, early days in Brazil. And I'm just really proud to be a part of it. Hello, and welcome to the Matrix BJJ podcast. I'm your host, Paul Tokizolu, and welcome to another week of the show. My guest today is Clark Gracie. Clark is the grandson of Carlos Gracie and the son of Carly Gracie. Over the years, Clark has won a number of jiu-jitsu tournaments, including becoming the Pan American Champion in 2013, the World Nogi Jiu-Jitsu Champion in 2009, the New York Open Champion in 2010, and winning tons of other tournaments across the world. I met Clark at a seminar that he did at Ramstein Jiu-Jitsu Club here in Germany. We didn't have an opportunity to do a podcast in person that day, but we were able to schedule one for over Skype. Clark taught an outstanding seminar. And if you ever have the opportunity to train with him, I highly recommend you take that opportunity. Please welcome someone who needs no further introduction, Clark Gracie. Thanks a lot for coming on the show today, man. How have you been? I've been great, Paul. It was great to hang out with you in, in Germany and uh, finally back home now, but uh, happy to be back and back to the academy, back to training. What uh, what locations did you end up visiting when you were over here in Europe? I uh, did, did quite a quite a few stops right before I, right after I left my house. I went to uh, Chicago for a few days with a friend of mine, Adam Brezovic, and then we went together to teach a weekend seminar uh, in Bosnia in Sarajevo and that was a lot of fun um, really a lot of history over there on the way there we stopped for, for a little while in Vienna and visited a friend of mine and uh, so just like love going to Europe and then you know made quite a few stops I mean I went to Barcelona after that visited Robin Gracie my cousin and uh, just love that that city really nice um, from there I went to Bordeaux and visited uh, Team Pythagore with uh, Manuel Fernandez really good team over there like huge seminar actually like really really growing in the area of france and then i went to amsterdam and then i went to see you guys in germany did the seminar there and then went back to amsterdam again for uh, an adidas seminar oh cool that i did uh the last day so man i yeah, love it's great i love amsterdam it's such a fun city to be in yeah it's great when the weather's good and it's not like freezing it's it's one of my favorite cities <laughs> How many times have you been? Amsterdam? Yeah. Amsterdam, probably probably about four or five times, something like that. That's awesome, man. That's so cool you get to travel all these places and teach jiu-jitsu. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I feel very lucky, you know, very blessed. But, uh, um, you know, a lot of hard work has paid off now. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure. What did you think of the jiu-jitsu level over here when you were teaching at all these different places? Is there anything that stood out? It's good, you know. Um, it's good, but I feel like in, in Europe it's definitely growing. You know, there's um, you, you see a lot of people that are running schools at sometimes lower belt, like purple belts or brown belts. You know, still running their schools, but yeah. but you know, it's kind of natural evolution of of the art. You know, the people, some of these guys have gone to Brazil to study or gone to the U.S. to study under people, and then come back and they're they're you know either coming from sometimes a different martial art background. And integrating jiu-jitsu into their their teaching, or or they're just you know trying to live their dream and, and then go with the jiu-jitsu lifestyle full on, and uh, and it's great, you know, it's great to see jiu-jitsu evolving and growing and, and spreading all over. So, and I think uh, Europe is is embracing it really well. 
Yeah, I, I agree, man. It's been pretty surprising for me, actually, to be over here and, and train, see how high the level is. And, you know, I've grown a lot over here. It was, it was a shock when I got over here at first. Yeah, yeah it's awesome, though. It was awesome to go on base and teach in Ramstein and, uh, and see this, uh, you know, group of Americans there that are just really motivated and passionate about it. And, you know, even though they're, they're, um, overseas and, uh, and, uh, you know, they find a group of people that, that love to do it. And, and you guys have a, an amazing, amazing place in whatever you guys train. Thanks, man. So. Yeah. There's some really good guys at the Ramstein school. They, um, really good purple belts teaching over there. What was the uh, jiu-jitsu style like in Bosnia? I haven't been able to make it down there. Yeah, there's there's some uh, big, strong guys over there for sure, you know. You can yeah. see Eastern European guys, but uh, but it's growing, you know. I think it's um, it's a little bit, uh, maybe just a few years behind, you know, Western Europe. But it's coming, you know, it's coming along. And uh, and I know that the, the Red Zivik team from Chicago is making a strong effort to, to grow it over there. They have an affiliate over there, so... You know, it's 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 on it's on its way. You know, but you know that, that's an example of a place that has a some schools with purple belt instructors, and and that's probably pretty common over there. You know, there's not too many black belts yet, which is the same as in a lot of places. But um, you know, it's definitely one of those places that's up and coming. Yeah. How have you seen jujitsu growing over Europe? Like over all the times that you've been here, has it changed drastically, or has it kind of progressed more along a steady rate? If that makes Actually, sense. I think Europe is is probably one of the fastest growing uh, over the past I don't know maybe eight years or maybe ten years uh, jiu-jitsu scene because uh, there's so many people that have moved to, to Europe to, to open schools and teach from maybe Brazil that maybe uh, or, or from the U.S. as well and and you see like the the Europeans I believe the European tournament this year had I think one of the highest numbers ever yeah. in for any tournament it, it was like record breaking i believe yeah, in, yeah in the three thousand numbers for a competitor you know and uh i th- think it was a four or five day tournament so that just shows you you know and that's just a small group of of the population that actually wants to compete yeah but uh you know imagine you know the rest of the percentage of, of the people that you know don't compete i mean it's it's definitely growing and uh you could find it seems like almost in every major city in, in europe now I think people like you coming over and teaching so many seminars are part of what's helping it grow so fast. Like every weekend there's some big name is coming through Europe to, to do, you know, a gang of seminars all over the place. Yeah, it is very common. You know, um, seems like every time I, I, I go to Europe, uh, I hear about, oh, so-and-so is just here, you know, and, uh, a lot of, a lot of people are, are visiting around and, and there's more and more terms now. So it's, it's drawing more people in yeah uh to come visit and you know people love europe you know people love europe just to vacation and to go there and be able to compete or uh be able to teach seminars and also you know visit the uh the area i mean all the different countries and cultures in such a a small region is a relatively small region you know it's, it's awesome yeah, and it makes it very easy to travel. You know, in the U.S., obviously, there's seminars all over the place, too, but it's so far away. Here, you just drive a few hours, and you can train with some world champion who's who's in, you know, a different country or something. It's great. A lot of opportunity. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really great you know, to see it growing and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the European people are embracing uh, jiu-jitsu very well, so I'm happy for that. Thanks a lot for, you know making it happen so to speak people like you coming and um you know of course i think when uh when hodger came over and set up his academy that was kind of a big step in the right direction and he brought a lot of talent over here that's my yeah, I think ignorance Roger's probably one of the first big names right to yeah um, i think so to decide to stay there and his dad i believe had been going there for years and then and then he was a teenager i think already coming to to um England for a while um, and start you know doing seminars and, and uh, reaching out this direction actually right before they started coming my dad had started coming into England to teach seminars I think oh, my I dad might have been the first first member of the Greasy family if not the first jiu-jitsu practitioner to bring jiu-jitsu to Europe you know which is kind of interesting that was like in the early 90s I think you know wow. something like that yeah, but you know, that was jiu jitsu was uh you know, just just barely sparking interest in even in the US, you know. 
So, Man, that's so cool. What made awesome. him want to come over at such an early time in jujitsu's growth? Do you do you know what inspired him to do that and take that step? You know, I'm not sure, but um, you know, my dad, he, I think he likes to travel. He likes to to see jujitsu uh, evolving and uh, spreading. You know, see his family's art. You know, my dad's from that older generation that you know had to go through that those proving stages. You know, to prove. The jiu-jitsu actually was efficient and was the best self-defense and was uh, the best um, mixed martial art, you know, Valley Tudo style um, at that time in, in like the 70s and, the, you know, in those early days. Um, and then, you know, the next generation came. And But um, my dad was also the first one to ever come to the U.S. You know, I think a lot of people don't know that and, and teach jiu-jitsu in, uh, in the early 70s. So... Um, you know, I'm not surprised that he he was excited to bring it to Europe as well. But uh, and then you know he didn't stay there, but you know he would come for seminars, and then a lot of people then started realizing, oh, okay, like let's go to Europe too. You know, there's a lot of a lot of places to go. You know, I think in those days people were kind of afraid to leave Brazil. You know, they were like, ah, you know, go explore the world, go into some foreign place. We don't know what's going to happen. So it was uh, it was an adventure for sure. That's really cool, man. He's he's quite a pioneer of our of our sport. I didn't know that yeah. he came over as early as the seventies. I knew that he came over really, you know, early, but the seventies yeah. is a lot yeah. earlier than I thought he had came. <laughs> yeah, a lot a lot of people tell me that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I didn't know that. You know, people recognize Horian, but my dad's, you know, he's very low key, you know, he doesn't really he doesn't really try to get too much attention or, or, or he doesn't really care about the fame and all that. So, um, you know, people people recognize other people for being uh, the earlier guys. You know, but uh, but yeah, he came uh, to teach the Marines actually in uh, Quantico, Virginia. Oh wow! He was wow. invited to go teach over there uh, while he was still in Brazil. The Marines were in Brazil and invited him over. And uh, and then I think only ten years later, then people from his family, from my dad's, you know, cousins, Horian, and and uh, you know some of these other guys started coming. He, he was trying to tell people to come, hey, come to the U.S., it's really nice, you know, and people are interested in jiu-jitsu. And, uh, you know, then they finally came, and it blew up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. That's that's crazy. I didn't know that. That's very uh, brave of him, you know, to come over as one of the first people and make that happen. Yeah. I mean, you could do an amazing podcast with him. Yeah, I'd love to, man. On. And uh, I mean, awesome. he's got some stories, you know. I would love to, to man. For sure. Love to. If he's ever bored and he's like, oh, I'll talk to this kid, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> that'd be awesome. And now I even have a, an affiliate in, in Oslo, you know. So, oh, really? Uh, so Dude, I didn't know that. something that's um, bringing me to Europe every every year now, you know, at least once or twice a year. I'm going to visit those guys. So, How did you get that set up, man? That's awesome. You know, it was a, it was a student that would come and, and train with me since White Belt. Uh, years ago and um, now he finally decided to open his own school just outside of oslo and and so you know norway is a beautiful country and yeah it's awesome great people great economy and, and uh you know i'm really happy to just to be able to go back and it gives me a great excuse to you know maybe spend a little bit more time in europe and, and visit a few other friends that i have that's awesome congrats to him and to you for having that affiliate that's that's really cool i hope yeah. to see you again sometime soon like definitely whenever you're back i'll try to Go to wherever it is you're you're teaching at. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. What a man! I wanted to ask you, how did your style get uh, created? You know, because traditionally, when you think about Gracie Jiu Jitsu, you think of a very like self defense style. But some of the stuff I've seen you use in uh, competitions, maybe I'm totally off base, but would maybe be a little more sporty. You know what I mean? And I was wondering, how did you come up with that? Yeah, you know, I think jiu-jitsu is something that's very personal and people can kind of, you know, they are martial artists, right? They are artists being the key word, you know, and they can create, and you see this with a lot of practitioners, you know, they create their own, their own um, niches, you know, they create their own, their own little styles within jiu-jitsu and, uh, and, you know, certain techniques, of course, like, just like anyone else, you know, I'll grasp a little bit better and, um, and I'll drill a little bit more and, I know I've had some good coaches that have told me like, oh, you do this technique really well, or and I've always been one to ask uh, ask questions as well about techniques and really like try to dig deep and find out what makes each technique work. 
and what um, you know what was the technique technique that, that's behind the leverage behind everything you know the what's the supporting factors you know and um, and so you know I have some some moves that I kind of gravitated towards and and uh, some sweeps and things that kind of went along with it but you know I, I do come from a very strong like uh, self-defense background as I think most people in my family do I think um, you know now the popular thing in jiu jitsu is the sport side of jiu jitsu and, yeah. and uh, this is this side of self defense is is slightly getting on, left on the back burner you know a little bit like left on the behind so you know i think it's important to preserve that side as well but you know the side people see of me mostly is is in competition and you know even when i'm teaching or doing seminars people want to see what they want to see right and usually that's going to be uh, mostly the the sport side so you know, I, I want to show them things that, of course, they don't know or they haven't maybe seen a million times already. So I try to show them things that are very unique to me, you know, things that yeah. work well for me and that I know not many other people we do. So, you know, when I do that, then people say, oh, wow, you, you, know, you have your very your own style and, um, you know, you do something a little different, you know, which I think everybody does some, certain things a little different. But, but um you know, people seem to know me for the omoplata, right? Which is, yeah. you know, even when I first learned it, is a, is a technique that most people think, of, oh, this is going to be a really hard, hard move to pull off. I, I thought that, you know, when I first learned it, when I was like a teenager. And now, you know, it's just uh, it's something that I had a lot of fun with, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I think if I just do a little bit acrobatic, you know, I like the physical side and the flow and not just like power and strength and like smash, but, you know, the finesse and the strategy, you know, like, setting traps and making the guy fall into traps you know yeah <laughs> this is something that's probably like my favorite side of jiu-jitsu you know it's like the mind game you know and I, I think a lot a lot of people understand that i don't know if everybody everybody uses that or thinks about that but but for me it's one of my favorite favorite things of jiu-jitsu you know, is the chess one of my favorite quotes about jiu-jitsu comes from a uh, vim deputer who is a black belt out of belgium and he said once in an interview that jujitsu is like you leave the door open in your house and you lure the bad guy in through the door and then you hit him over the head with a chair. <laughs> and um, I try to think yeah. about that whenever I'm setting things up. But he does it much better than me. I, I Sometimes I cannot be very sneaky. I think a lot of the people who are much better than me tell me that being sneaky is one of the most important parts of the game. Yeah. Being sneaky, I think, uh, you know, this is something that, that comes a little bit from the Brazilian culture, you know, which is uh, <laughs> not something, nothing to do with jiu-jitsu, but comes like from a word called malandragem, you know, malandragem. And it's like, and it's this like strategical, being sneaky, being a little bit like crafty. And uh, and I think because jiu-jitsu came from Brazil, it has that, that characteristic, you know, and... Uh, and I remember somebody telling me when I was like a purple belt, like, uh, Clark's really good, but he needs to work a little bit more the malandragem, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I remember that and I'm thinking like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to think about that. And, you know, I, at first it's something is like, how am I supposed to work that? You know, like, how am I supposed to add that? You know, it's something that only really comes with time, you know, being sneaky, being crafty, being like, you know, uh, setting things up in, a, in that way. But, um, but, you know, with time it comes and you start to feel, you start to see like, oh, you know, this position connects to this. And I think it's really important for that side to like work the transitions, you know, is to not just practice one move. Like, okay, I know how to do an arm bar or triangle, but can you connect arm bar to triangle or connect arm bar to omoplata to triangle and, 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 and go kind of like seamless, you know, yeah. like guy escapes one and then he's automatically falling into another. You know, I like to, to have that. That jiu-jitsu where it's like I'm losing one move, but I'm already on to the next before the guy even fully escapes that technique. You know, you know, I, I, I do jiu-jitsu. I'm, I'm mostly stimulated by the uh, by the uh, submissions. You know, what I mean, sweeps are awesome. You know, you can get some really nice sweeps and feel feel amazing doing them. But um, but the submissions is what what really gets me off. You know. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think that people have this idea that omoplata, for example, is not effective? Do you think that they're not setting it up correctly? Or maybe, like you said, they don't have any follow-on submissions to go to after that? I mean, 
uh, there's a lot of details, you know. There's a lot of details, Sobopana. There's a lot of uh, tiny movements that are, are, are critical to make and uh, areas to be tight, areas to be loose, areas of mobility, certain grips that are essential. That does the same as a lot of techniques, but I think Wapana has a, at least double of the details than mm. a, another technique. If you really look into it, you know, it's a, there's a lot of lot going on. You know, and, uh, yeah. And, and, and the multiple ways to finish as well, you know, which I think a lot of people don't realize. So, you know, for me, it's a, it's a position that I started doing this sweep since I was, uh, I think, an orange belt. This backwards rolling sweep, uh, sweep the guy over. Yeah. And then uh, one of my coaches said, hey, Rodrigo Madero, so remember he telling me, hey, you do this sweep really well. You know, this works really well for you. And then I was start drilling it more. And I was like, oh, okay, well, well, Plata works really well with this sweep, you know. So I kind of started training them back and forth together. And then uh, put more and more time into drilling and and then started, uh, you know, just finding more omoplatas, you know. And I like lasso guard, and omoplata also fits well with lasso guard. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, I don't like people to think that omoplata is the only thing I do. You know, I like to play top game a lot as well. Not that you can't find omoplata from the top either, but uh, but I'm really, you know, I started thinking about, I think when I first got my black belt, I, I was, um, people were telling me, okay, go for omoplata because that's your move, you know. But um, then I started kind of really focusing on my guard too much and started not really being as balanced as a, as a top player. And then so a little bit later, I started thinking, like, okay, I better try to balance out my game, you know, and really try to make sure I feel confident with guard passing and just being on top. Because at Brown Belt, I was more of a passer. I was more of like a mound, cross choke, kind of simple jiu-jitsu. You know? But you go through your phases, right? Everybody yeah, for that. sure. You know, it might be a case where your omoplata is so good that people don't get to see the next setups, you know, the next steps and stuff like that in the tournament because – you get the first submission you go for. Yeah, I try, you know. I try. My, my dad has told me in the past, like, you know, at maybe Blue Belt, you get a submission on a guy, and that's a that's a battle within a battle. It's like, now, will he be successful to escape, and will he beat your attempt to submit, or will you be able to finish it, you know? So I think, you know, evolving you know, as a person in Jiu-Jitsu, as an athlete and, and competitor, it's important to be able to finish the submissions that you go for, you know, not just um, go for them and then let people escape and then you're on to the next, you know. So yeah. really, really be able to finish, you know, that's like a little bit of a challenge within, within jiu-jitsu right there. When it comes to finishing, I mean, I know this might be a little broad, but what's a mistake you see a lot of people doing that prevents them from finishing a submission? Do you think it's a mindset th- uh, factor or maybe more of a technique, technical error? It's that I don't like. I just said uh, about you know trying to actually be determined to finish that technique, whatever the submission may be. And I think a lot of people will let go of a submission sometimes to switch to a position that will get you points. You know, for example, like I see a lot of people uh, from time to time do like omoplata to take the back. You know, it's something that I can I can understand doing. But I would never really want to do it, you know, because yeah. it's like I'm going to give up a position where I'm going to end the fight to just go to a different position where I could begin my attempt to, to end the fight on the back, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes, you know, people people aren't as committed to, to finishing that, that move, that submission. But it really varies person to person, you know, like everybody's different, so. Yeah, it's it's kind of confusing because in training, sometimes you're told to not pursue every single submission to its end. You know, almost like if you're rolling with someone and they're trying really hard to go for every single submission, um, it might come off almost like they're going too rough during the roll. Yeah. But the thing is, is I feel like once you get to a higher level, you have to roll like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely see what you mean. Um, I guess... Like for me, I, I can think about you know my past and and about a purple belt, blue to purple belt. I was I was loving like the flow, you know. I was loving the that constant transition. And, and yeah. I, I had a few training partners that that I would love training with. And and uh, for example, we'd get into uh, I'd attack an armbar on him, then I'd escape. Then he 
he'd uh, roll into an old plata and then he'd switch to this and that. And then, like, we'd catch submissions and kind of, like, let it go just to see where it goes, never really putting in 100% yeah. like uh, power, but really exploring the, the transition side. And I think that's, like, a, an essential part of becoming a good good jiu-jitsu player, you know, is, uh, is just understanding that because if you just think, like, one, one position at a time, it's, like, thinking one-dimensional, you know. It's um, and so really exploring that transition and really letting your jujitsu flow, you know, like yeah. letting your jujitsu flow is to make you grow more, you know, and uh, and, uh, and you see the evolution of of, uh, of your own style, you know, becoming that way. But eventually, like I think when I was about brown belt, like late brown belt, I asked one of my cousins and. They told me, hey, uh, I said, what do you think you know, I should work on? And he said, man, I see you get to a lot of good positions, he told me. But you you let it go and you transition. And, and he, said, he told me exactly what I was saying before. is like, get to a position and make it, that's the end of the line. Like, that's it. It's done there. You know, like, if you get to the back, make it the, where the guy's going to tap on the back. You know, don't get to the back and then you switch to the mount and then, you know, stomach side control, moving all around like crazy. You know, and, you know, dominating, but never really coming to like a, a final point, you know, where it's done, you know. So he said, try to try to be a little bit more controlling and uh, and finish when you get to a good position. Don't let the guy squirm out and and finish it, you know. And then that kind of also influenced me to kind of change my style a little bit to just like finish that game, you know. So that's really I think I, I, I think I took the right steps, you know. I think it's uh, it's important to go through all those phases. Yeah, that's really insightful. Um I think that it's so it's so uh tempting, like you said, in the blue to purple belt phase when you kind of know a decent amount of techniques and you some people would even say like at purple belt you probably have seen all of the techniques in jiu-jitsu. Now it's just a matter of perfecting and getting the little details correct. You know, but it's so tempting. You have all these techniques. You've got like a whole tool belt and you just want to like practice and play around with everything. But sometimes that means you're not practicing to finish, like like you said. It's part of part of just growing your jiu you know. What uh what stage do you think you are at you're at right now? You know, if let's say blue to pur- blue and purple was maybe flowing, brown was finishing, what about right now as you're kind of progressing through the um black belt? I think it's a tough tough uh, question to answer really it's um you never really know where you are until it's behind you i feel like you know yeah but um i I think i'm just just kind of uh perfecting um my style you know you can still get you can still add little things and little little tiny grips or movements that um, help make it a little bit better um even even as a teacher becoming a better teacher to understand my students and understand what they need but also understanding what I'm doing to be able to teach it, you know, a lot of people do a lot of a lot of things without even really fully understanding what they do themselves. You know, they just do it. I think the majority of people they they just do things without um, really knowing how to break it down. You know. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm I'm at that phase where right now I'm I'm trying to become a better teacher and uh, and I like teaching and I I love to see my my students get better and doing doing their techniques so smooth, so tight, or whether they're using my techniques, you know, I mean, things that I use, you know, it brings me a lot of joy to see that. You know, it's just, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just getting better as a overall, you know, leader of my team. <laughs> That's so cool, man. That's yeah. really nice. That's it's cool that you have that opportunity. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I'm, I'm seeing my, my, my team grow now. You know, we have uh, academies all over the world now, and uh, you know, I'm just really loving this this forever evolving jiu-jitsu lifestyle. You know, it's um, things you never think would be possible years ago now are becoming possible. So, Yeah, man, the, the internet's great. opening up so much opportunity for, for athletes and association leaders and there's so much opportunity that you can have that you've never had before, whether it's traveling in Europe or opening up different schools. It's a great time. And you're seeing people get involved with jiu-jitsu that you know, never would be expected to be involved with it maybe uh, 20 years ago, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I mean, 
you know, years ago in, in Brazil, you know, you see like old school Carlson Gracie team, you know, that was dominating at the time. A lot of really, you know, big tough guys, you know, like Carlson himself. Um, and now you're seeing this whole new culture of people that are doing jiu-jitsu that don't look athletic at all, but are extremely technical and, uh, you know, are very unassuming, but very dangerous. And, and this is the new guy now that you got to watch out for, like maybe more than the bigger guys. Yeah. Because they're, they're the more technical ones. And, you know, they're embracing jiu-jitsu and it's, some amazing things are coming out of it. Yeah. And we're also seeing lots of really young people getting to a very high level. Is something I've noticed in the past like couple of years, like um, I'm you know at the ADCC trials for example, you had uh, Nikki Ryan for example, 16, 15 years old. He took third place in his weight category. You know, like there's all sorts of people. I was reading an article today on flow grappling where they were talking about uh, several other athletes. Uh, one one girl, I forget her name. Uh, I'm gonna. I wish I remembered, but I'll put it in the show notes. But she won. She is uh, 16 years old, and she won her category. So she's going to yeah, the ADCC Champions. I saw that. Yeah, it's awesome. Amazing. You know, I, I feel was, like I was there too with some of my students. And uh, oh, that's awesome. I saw that girl. I saw that girl competing. You know, with the real short hair from Anchorage, Alaska. Yes, like, yes. Yeah, and I remember watching her one fight, and then I saw her again. And I'm like, man, watch out for this girl. Like, she looks like she's <laughs> she's good. You yeah, know? And, uh, super badass. And aggressive and tough. And then you find out, you know, where they're from, and you're like. Where are these people? Where are these people coming from? Where are they training over there in Anchorage, Alaska? Or this other guy that won the, uh, I think, under eighty eight division. I think he's a UFC fighter, but from like North Carolina, you know. And uh, all these people you see over there, and, you know, it's kind of this dogey culture. I guess you get get a lot more wrestlers. And there's a whole different scene than uh, than the IBJJF, you know. And uh, yeah, man, you know, different rules, and so you get a lot more of these these wrestlers and these. It's tough people coming out of nowhere. The next so. generation. And uh, Elizabeth Clay, that's her name. Elizabeth Clay. Okay. But yeah, she's 16 years old. It's awesome. And um, I mean, I've heard of people like who homeschool their kids just so they can train jujitsu full time. You know, they're 13 or 14 years old or something, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's incredible that's happening now, right? Um, and it's probably these parents that, you know, they wish they could have, uh, you know, been uh been in their kids situation you know, yeah to, man uh, exactly to really go so far you know and so they're putting their kids to to go to the highest level but uh, definitely you're right i mean it, people are getting younger and getting better and imagine when those kids reach to be 25 you know 10 years or something like that they're already they've already competed at adcc worlds and you know had all these experiences they're gonna be monsters yeah yeah, I remember thinking like when I was competing, like, oh man, I wish I was uh, the older generation because you know you could sometimes do maybe just a few fights and become a Pan American champion or a world champion. You know, nowadays yeah. it's like seven fights, you know, in the bigger divisions and seven eight fights sometimes, and, and you know, it's it's amazing. There's some, you know, there's actually one person out of those maybe uh, 130, 150 people divisions that come out on top. You know, it's like. It's amazing, you know. It's like running a marathon or something, you know. Yeah. And you know, see, see, see that happening um, now. You know, you just imagine the future. You know, you imagine this, the next generation, my, my children. You know, when, when they end up uh, out there, you know, what's that going to be like? You know, I mean, it's just multiplying. You know, so definitely interesting. To see what's uh, what's to come. We're gonna have. We're gonna all be in for a rude awakening when all these kids turn to be like twenty three. They're all jacked, and they've been doing heel hooks since they were like twelve. Yeah, it's gonna be scary. Clark, I know you gotta head out, but is there anything you gotta you would like to promote, or anything you'd like to say before we wrap this up? You know, I'm I'm uh, just working right now. I'm moving my new academy, my academy in San Diego, so it's taking a lot of time. So I, you know, I like to always invite people to come come visit me in San Diego, and uh, we have a you know great training environment, great feeling, and uh, you know, I like to promote the 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 good jiu-jitsu spirit you know and i think that's you know most most people promote that and under, understand that but you know there sometimes people can can take uh their ego a little too far and this and that and i think you know marcelo garcia recently put out a speech that it seems like everybody's talking about yeah it was very i think positive positive message and and good maybe just like a bit of a wake-up call you know so i'd like to leave this kind of 
same um, feeling when I'm leaving a message on the mat or or just in general as I've passed through life, you know. And um, so I like to promote that, that positive side of jiu-jitsu. And um, other than that, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm living the jiu-jitsu lifestyle. I'm loving it. And uh, I'm loving to see people enjoying the jiu-jitsu that, that my family has uh, started a couple of generations back in the early, early days in Brazil. And I'm just really proud to be a part of it. Clark, my thanks so much for... To grow. Oh, you know, like like I said, I go to Oslo and, and uh, around the world, the, the, the affiliates. So this is a beautiful side of jiu-jitsu. But thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, dude. Thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. It was great. And Clark, next time you're here, I hope we can do this in person. That'd be great. Thanks a lot, man. Have a great day. Thank you. Oh, you too. Thanks again to Clark for being on the show. It was an honor to have you as a guest. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes or Stitcher and give us a five-star rating and a review. It's a really easy and great way to support the show. Additionally, go to Matrix.com for all the other episodes of the podcast and to sign up for the newsletter. If you've been enjoying the podcast and you want more content, sign up for the newsletter and you'll receive weekly updates as to what's going on around here. As always, thanks to the musical artist artists who support this podcast. Thanks to Vinny Russo, who you're listening to right now. And thanks to Waves Overhead for producing the theme song for this podcast. For links to pages where you can download all their music, go to matrix.com and you'll have links to Waves Overhead and also Vinny Russo. I'm going to play for you the song To Make Amends by Waves Overhead, which is the theme song for the podcast. You heard a little bit at the beginning and you'll hear the rest of it right now.